this panel is called Capitalism and Poverty. And our distinguished panelists are going to pose and answer a number of questions, such as, is capitalism moral? Is capitalism fair? Is capitalism the right approach for the developing world? How do the poor fare under capitalism? Indeed, how do alternative economic systems treat the poor? For the morally minded amongst us, how a system treats the least among us is not an idle question. And nor should it be for any of us who are interested in promoting freedom. As Charles Murray so nicely served up to us last night, we've kind of hit the end of diminishing returns on what policy can achieve for us. What empirical data even in the proofs of economics can do for us. We're at the point where we need to have a cultural innovation uh, and we need to win the cultural war in favor of the fairness of capitalism. And this panel will help us address that fundamental question. Now this being the Hillsdale College Free Market Forum, there won't be any doubt about the eff 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 efficacy of markets, about its utility. But with their help, I hope we will begin to address the question of how do we promote and sell capitalism as a fair and just system. To help lead us off in this line of inquiry this morning is Professor Rose. David C. Rose is a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. His latest book is entitled The Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior, and his forthcoming book, Why Culture Matters Most, will be from Oxford University Press early next year, uh, 2015. He also contributes actively to policy debates through radio interviews and op-eds on topics ranging from social security, monetary policy, fiscal policy, judicial philosophy, and healthcare reform. His bachelor's degree in economics is from Missouri State University, and his PhD in economics from the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rose. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, you've probably heard the old quip that uh, says that unless everyone's identical, uh, equal treatment inevitably produces unequal outcomes, and forcing equal outcomes inevitably requires unequal treatment. This quip highlights a well-known distinction uh, between two different ways of thinking about fairness and equality. Uh, you know, we can, we can think of fairness as receiving equal treatment, what one might call fairness as process, and we can think of uh, fairness as receiving equal payoffs, what uh, one might call fairness as outcome. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about why capitalism is not in any way unfair. It's not unfair by a fairness as process standard, and it's not unfair uh, by a outcome standard. The, the arguments I'm going to make are very, very simple. The issues involved are very, very simple, but as I'm sure you all know, Often the most important things are so simple we skate right over the top, but that doesn't make them any less important. Finally, I hope I'll close uh, strong with an argument for why capitalism, if anything, is more than fair. Okay, uh, capitalists and people who are advocates of capitalism uh, tend to interpret unequal outcomes in a free market society as something that's not terribly alarming, something that's kind of a natural byproduct of the fact that people have different talents and have different tastes. Some people have very different tastes regarding effort, uh, willing to invest, and, uh, you know, taste for risk. If you have uh, people uh, in a system where the rules of the game are consistently and fairly applied, these differences in talents and tastes will inevitably produce different outcomes. And that's pretty much the beginning and end of it for them. So capitalism quite naturally does quite well on a fairness as process kind of standard. And indeed, if anything, capitalism is extremely dependent on fairness as process. Um, when the rules of the game are not fairly and even handedly applied, uh, it dramatically increases the risk of doing anything uh, of any great uh, merit and as a result, discourages people uh, from doing the very sorts of things that make capitalism uh, an engine for prosperity. Uh, 
Why? Well, if uh, the rules of the game can be changed willy-nilly from above, and certainly we've had a lot of experience with that over the last few years, People, who, uh, people who, who might consider uh, doing something extraordinary have to worry about de facto shakedowns from, from the government. They also have to worry about their competitors being favored by the government if their competitors happen to be allied with the government. So this is uh, one reason why people who are either capitalists or advocates of, of capitalism are big fans of the rule of law. I mean, the rule of law is nothing if not a plea for fairness as a matter of process. The rule of law is not consistent with fairness as a matter of outcomes, although we have a few Supreme Court justices that don't seem to understand that. Okay, uh, so why is uh, capitalism not unfair even by a process standard? Well, uh, I'm sorry, uh, next slide. Uh, as an outcome standard, uh, unlike capitalists, social justice theorists uh, view uh, fairness as something that is pretty much, for the most part, only a matter of outcomes. When they see, when they look at a free market society and they see that some people have far more than others, they immediately suspect that something is awry. Now, what's, what's really particularly uh, interesting about their position now is even if they can't point to some aspect of the process that's unfair, that's in other words, they can't see how there's anything unfair about the process itself, if they see an unequal outcome, they view it as ipso facto evidence of unfairness. For them, unequal outcomes equals unfair. What I'm going to argue now, though, is that even by the implicit moral standards employed by people who favor social justice theory, capitalism is indisputably fair. Now, why, how could that possibly be? How could, how could uh, social justice theorists be so wrong? Well, I'm going to explain why uh, social justice theorists simply don't think carefully enough about the nature of cooperation. Cooperation is a hugely important thing to get right, because if you think about it, capitalism is so spectacularly successful at fostering uh, human flourishing and advancement because it does the best job of any known system for supporting cooperation. So if you don't get the basics of cooperation right, you're going to miss the whole point about capitalism, and that's what I think that they do. Okay, uh, let's talk about cooperation. Now, there's me on the left, and there's you. I hope you don't mind being uh, treated as a randomly drawn young woman. And what this signifies is that alone I make 10 units of something, alone you make 10 units of something, but when we work together, and you see the two pictures stuck together, that means we're now like a team, a cooperative node. We work together, we make 26. Not, not 20, but 26. And the point of this is to capture the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that is the essence of cooperation. When we work together, we do better than when we work alone added up. That difference is known as the cooperative surplus. And it's a measure of how important cooperation is. And it's a measure of how strongly two people might be attracted to each other to cooperate. So in this example, um, the cooperative surplus is clearly six. Now, one thing that's cool about the cooperative surplus is that the cooperative surplus is what explains why people are willing to voluntarily cooperate. For people to voluntarily enter into transactions with each other in order to cooperate, it has to be in both of their best interests, so the transaction has to be mutually beneficial. Well, the only way it can be mutually beneficial is if there's something being produced beyond the sum of the parts that can be divided between them. Cooperative surpluses, though, are important in an even deeper way. General prosperity is basically uh, the amount of goods and services we have per person. That's what it is. You cannot increase the amount of goods and services per person by just moving goods and services around. You still end up with the same amount of goods and services per person. What capitalist societies do, though, is they create incentives that induce people to cooperate. And as they cooperate, each one of those nodes of cooperation is producing that little surplus. So there's an extra six floating around, or an extra 10, or an extra 20. That indeed increases the amount of goods and services per person. So cooperative surpluses are the key. They are the sine qua non of general prosperity. So if they're so important, where do they come from? Well, cooperative surpluses come from cooperative synergies, and there's all kinds of them. I can't cover any more than a couple, but I'm showing two guys here carrying a couch, because anyone who's ever carried a couch knows that two guys are way more productive than twice one. It's not even close. But by far and away, the most important source of cooperative synergy 
is uh, the one that we uh, all know from Adam Smith's famous pin factory example. Uh, when people get together, work together, and divide up tasks to effectuate gains from specialization through the division of labor, their productivity goes up dramatically. We're talking about tens of thousands of percent. I've actually worked this out, and I require my students to do that. It's really astounding, uh, the increase in output that results from cooperation. Okay, so we're cooperating, and cooperating is good, and a natural question is, how should we divide the output from cooperation? Well, first, let's zero in on uh, the surplus. That 10 that I produce, and that 10 that you produce, uh, that's mine, that's yours, that's what you gave up, but the six of the surplus, that really isn't mine, and that's not yours, in no way, shape, or form. It truly is ours. I couldn't have made it without you, you couldn't have made it without me. So as a result, neither one of us has a stronger claim on that six. So as a result, the simplest thing to do is just split it down the middle. Now there are very good economic reasons, political reasons, sociological reasons, anthropological reasons for why we do this. And even social justice theorists would readily agree that evenly splitting cooperative surpluses is the way to go. And I believe it's the way to go, and I'm gonna argue later that that's what the way it normally works out. So, how should the other 20 units be allocated? We've got 26, six of them are surplus, the other 20, what do we do with those? Well, those other 20 units are properly thought of as our respective opportunity costs. Um, paying everyone their opportunity costs as part of the payoff of the, of the endeavor is only fair because it compensates people for what could be unequal contributions. Uh, it would be, it'd be rather like if um, Anita paid everyone, reimbursed everyone, the average amount for airfares when some people traveled from a much greater distance and had to pay more. That would be nonsense, that would be patently unfair, even under a fairness as outcome standard. So you gotta pay people their opportunity cost, and there's no way you can pay anybody more than their opportunity cost without paying somebody less than their opportunity cost by construction of the example. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means my payoff is the 10 that I would have made that I sacrificed by cooperating with you, because I can't make it now because I'm cooperating with you, plus my share of the surplus, which is three. Your payoff is the 10 you could have made, the 10 you sacrificed by cooperating with me, plus your half of the surplus, which is an, another three, and therefore 13. So we both get paid 13 in this case. Very simple. Now, in this particular example, equally splitting the surplus results in an equal split of the final output. So you might be saying, well, what's, what's the point of this example? This sure sounds like what the social justice theorists are advocating. Well, the problem is, in the real world, things are almost never this simple. In the real world, we're confronted with examples like this. In the real world, we have a situation where somebody like me makes two, working by myself. Somebody like you, you guys are obviously more productive than I am, uh, makes 10, and together we make 16. So this is a different payoff structure, different, different game. Now, should we cooperate? Well, cooperation is still very much in both our interests. The whole of 16 is greater than the sum of the parts of 12. There's a cooperative surplus of four, so it makes sense for us to work together for us to cooperate. But the payoffs now are gonna be a little different. You see, my payoff is the two that I get to cover my opportunity costs for having sacrificed my time, plus my share of the surplus, which is also two. Two plus two is four. Your payoff is the 10 that you had to sacrifice. You had to sacrifice far more in order for us to cooperate. And your half of the surplus, which is 10, so um, your payoff is 12. So by my reckoning, um, you should get three times more than me, which is probably the best thing you've heard since this conference started, right? <laughs> and to some third party who's not looking carefully at the inputs, this looks like a, a gross inequity. This couldn't possibly be fair. But I'm going to argue that it's indisputably fair by the fairness as outcome standard. Look, everyone's getting an equal share of the surplus. There's no question that that is fair by the fairness as outcome standard. But at, at the same time, everyone is, get, is bearing an equal part of the burden of making the output possible because they're all being fully restored and no more for their personal opportunity costs. So both elements of this payoff are fair as a matter of outcome. Now to see why this is an important thing to, for people to understand, let's suppose that there's a rule that says we have to split output evenly. We need to, quote, spread it around a little more, close quote. 
Well, in that case, uh, the payoff would be 16 divided by 2, which is 8 for each of us, right? Now, what would you do? You can make 10 by yourself, or you can cooperate with me, put up with me, and uh, get 8. What are you going to do? Uh, my guess is you're not going to cooperate with me. Well, in that case, everybody loses. I fall from getting 4 to only getting 2, because I don't have you to work with. You fall from getting 12 to getting 10. So if we force equal sharing of output in the name of social justice, we should be clear that the result is either that we'll have less prosperity because someone like you will choose not to cooperate with someone like me, or less freedom because you were forced to cooperate with me against your will. It's got to be one or the other. Think of it this way. If fairness is all about equality, so inequality is bad, then inequality should also be bad with respect to bearing an unequal burden of the input contribution. So my first big claim is that paying people their opportunity costs plus an equal share of the surplus satisfies the fairness as outcome standard. My second big claim is that capitalism is therefore fair by the fairness as outcome standard because it drives us to these very kinds of solutions. Now, why would that be true? Well, capitalism endorses honest competition and voluntary transacting. So everyone has to be paid their opportunity costs or they won't enter into these transactions to begin with. So there's not going to be any unequal burdens imposed by input contribution. At the same time, competition in a capitalist system drives equal splitting of surpluses. Just think about it. You can transact with somebody, uh, two people, they're identical. One person wants three-fourths of the surplus, the other will go for half. Who do you think always gets left on the sideline? The dominant strategy is for everyone to propose and everyone to accept an equal split of genuine surpluses. So capitalism is inherently fair by the fairness as outcome standard. Now I'm going to make uh, what I hope you view as an incredible claim that capitalism isn't just fair, it's more than fair. Now recall that in our second example, you got three times as much as I did, okay? But this is not just more than fair to you, as it would appear to anyone, it's more than fair to me too. Why? Well, first, why is it more than fair to you? You put in 10, you sacrifice 10, and you get back 12, okay? But I put in two and I get back four. By the fairness as outcome standard, this is obviously more than fair. Think about it this way. It's impossible to make an outcome more equal than equal. But it's not impossible to make an outcome better than equal. Suppose I offer you the following deal. You give me a $5 bill, I'll give you a $5 bill. Is that equal? Sure. Is that unfair? No. Is it fair? Yeah. Is it stupid? Sure. <laughs> now suppose I said, hey, you know what? This is just kind of boring. I got a new idea. You give me a five, and then I'll give you a ten. And we'll just do that as long as you want. <laughs> now, if we do that, the outcome for you is indisputably more than fair. It's better than equal, and if equal's fair, more better than equal has to be more than fair. It's just simple logic. So, here's the key idea. Capitalism lets everyone take more out than they put into the system all at the same time because of the positive sum nature of cooperative transactions. So at every step along the way, the whole is always equaling more than the sum of the parts. This is a beautiful thing, and, and the key thing is to remember it's all about voluntary transactions. Often people will say, oh, I, I believe in Adam Smith, I get it, yeah, you'll have a more prosperous society if you have free trade, blah, 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 but that still doesn't explain, that still doesn't assure us that rich people don't end up being rich at the expense of poor people. And it's true, if you don't read Adam Smith very, very carefully, you can reach that conclusion quite easily. But you have to remember, we only allow voluntary transactions, so that means that every one of those margins, you have to make the other person better off. You have no choice because he doesn't have to transact with you. So this is not a result that's just true in the aggregate. It's also true at the most micro level added up. It's also consistent with over a century of evidence from around the world. I mean, 
clearly. It's much better to be a poor person, say the median person in the lowest quintile of a thriving capitalist society than it is to be an average person uh, in a centrally planned society. We know this. this is, there's no need to cite statistics. This is just so obvious. So why is this so hard to see? If the logic is so clear and the evidence is so clear, why is this so hard to see? Well, as I mentioned earlier, social justice theorists leave out half the outcome story. They leave out the inputs that make the output possible. Another reason why this is so hard to see is that uh, most people have no idea where goods and services come from. They have no idea how we end up with a GDP. They have no theory of GDP determination at all. Nothing. So as a result, they do the only thing they can do. They don't consciously choose to do this, but just think about it. If you have absolutely no theory for where output comes from, you have to assume that it's fixed. You have to assume that it's effectively manna from heaven. You have no choice. What else are you going to assume? Well, if you assume that output is effectively manna from heaven, then that means it's going to fall no matter what any of us, us, of us do. There's no meaningful differences in opportunity cost across us. And whatever our actions are will not affect the total output. In that case, the division of the output is fundamentally a zero-sum game. So if I get more, you or somebody else has to get less. Now, in such a world where output is in fact manna from heaven, it is indeed impossible for everyone to get more out than they put in all at the same time. In fact, it's total nonsense and fantasy. But this is the exact logical frame that most people have. Luckily, that's not the case for capitalism. True, honest capitalism is positively abuzz with positive sum cooperative activity. Cooperative surpluses that impel voluntary transactions make it possible for everyone to get more out than they put in at every single step of the way. So with capitalism, everyone can get more out, much more out, than they put in all at the same time. So capitalism isn't just fair as process, it's also fair as outcome. Indeed, it's more than fair to everyone any way you slice it. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have a great new takeaway I'm gonna steal from you. Manna from heaven economics. <laughs> Our next speaker, George Aite is president of the Free Africa Foundation, which he established in 1993 in Washington, D.C., to serve as a catalyst for change in Africa. The foundation actively promotes political, economic, and intellectual freedom, and has popularized the statement that Africa is poor because she is not free. Dr. Aite has taught at American University, Wayne State College in Nebraska, and Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania. He's also been a national fellow at the Hoover Institution and a resident scholar at the Heritage Foundation. He's an author and has written several, high, several highly acclaimed books on Africa, including Africa Betrayed, which won the H.L. Mencken Award. He's widely quoted in newspapers and is a guest on many TV and radio programs. And I might mention our Poverty Cure program that Acton Institute has produced and many of the scholars here have received. You're one of the stars in that. So we knew you when. He's a native of Ghana, West Africa. He earned his master's degree in economics at the University of Western Ontario and his PhD from the University of Manitoba in 1981. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ayite. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Anita uh, Folson and also uh, Chris uh, for inviting me to uh, speak to you at this forum. And I also would like to thank you for finding some time uh, to come and listen to me. And um, I was listening to uh, David Rowe when he was talking about capitalism. But capitalism is a dirty word in Africa. It is a word which I wouldn't, you know, would very much hesitate to push in Africa. Why? Because after independence from colonial rule, African leaders argued that, see, they made one monumental syllogistic error. 
They argue that colonialism was evil and exploitative. And because the colonialists were capitalists, aha, it meant that capitalism too was evil and exploitative. And therefore, they were going to adopt socialism as their guiding ideology. But you see, they didn't even understand socialism. So how much more can they promote capitalism? See, the, uh, uh, the type of socialism they practiced was a peculiar form of Swiss bank socialism, which allowed the head of state and his cohort of ministers to rip and plunder Africa's you know, treasuries for deposit in Switzerland. A cabinet minister in Mugabe's government was asked to define socialism, and he said, here in Zimbabwe, socialism means that what is mine is mine, but what is yours, we share. <laughs> Don't ask him to define capitalism, because we say here in Zimbabwe, capitalism means what is mine is mine, but what is yours, I take with interest. Now, <clears throat> Dos Santos has been the president of Angola for more than 34 years. He, was been a, he has been a Marxist dictator of Angola. Now, all of a sudden, he says that primitive capital accumulation is good for Africa, naturally. His daughter, Isabella, is now the youngest woman billionaire in Africa. Now, the hypocrisy of African leaders and the chicanery of the ruling elites are what has brought Africa down. There are 55 African countries, and most of them are not doing well. Despite the immense mineral wealth of the continent, I mean, you name the mineral and you find it in Africa. Gold, diamonds, palladium, they're all there in Africa. But despite the mineral wealth, the vast majority of the African people are still married in poverty, abject poverty, economic stagnation, and deprivation. In fact, the United Nations estimated that if, at the current rate of economic growth or progress, it would take Africa 150 years before it satisfies the Millennium Development Goals. That's what the United Nations says. And also, the World Bank, back in 2008, determined that the number of people living in poverty in Africa hasn't really changed much in the past 20 years. More than half of Africans live in poverty. Of the 55 African countries, fewer than 10 can be called economic success stories. And fewer still have an independent and free press. Back in 1990, only four African countries were democratic. Today, 23 years later, 13. So in other words, it's taken us 23 years to add nine more democracies. At this rate, it would take Africa more than a century to become fully democratic. Now, there are some of us who are very angry, angry at the condition of Africa. Things should never have turned out this way. Now, Africa has more dictators per capita than any other continent. And get this, no dictator has brought lasting prosperity to any African country. And I tell you what, there's no such thing as a benevolent dictator. <laughs> the only good dictator is a dead one. <laughs> there are so many people who want to help Africa. And it's noble to help Africa, of course. You know, it's, it's part of our Christian impulse to help the unfortunate. But there are certain pitfalls that we must avoid. Right now, there's a lot of buzz about Africa. You hear Africa rising. Africa is the fastest growing continent. Is this real or hype? 
Much of it is hype. And it is something that we should avoid. And you see, this is the favorite gambit of the World Bank and Western donors. See, they have pumped more than 600 billion into Africa since 1960 with little to show for it. So they are desperate for a success story. Even small baby steps are hailed at giant strides. Now, <clears throat> remember Ivory Coast. In the early 1990s, Ivory Coast was hailed as an economic miracle. What happened? In 2000 and 2005, it descended into brutal civil war. My own country, Ghana, is also touted as an economic success story. But now, the country is broke. And even Fitch, the international bond rating company, has lowered Ghana's bond rating from a B plus to a B. And the country's total national debt is 50% of its GDP. Then there was Uganda. It was also hailed by Western donors as an economic success story. What happened? Things have changed. Now, its president, back in 1986, said, no African leader should be in power for more than 10 years. He's still there. <laughs> and then we had Egypt, Tunisia. They were all hailed as an economic success stories. But now? Now, secondly, <clears throat> sure, Africa is growing very rapidly. But we have to make a distinction between economic growth and economic development. The two are not the same thing. You can have economic growth without development. As a matter of fact, this was the case of Angola and Nigeria. In 2008, Angola's economy expanded at a phenomenal rate of 20.8%. But today, 60% of Angolans live in poverty. It's the same in Nigeria. I'm not saying that there are no economic success stories in Africa. There are, but there are few. And even then, those countries' economic success stories like Rwanda, Ethiopia, Ghana, Benin, they are small countries. They don't have the locomotive heft to pull the rest of the continent out of its economic miasma. Sure, Africa is growing, but the growth it's not internally generated. The recent growth that you're seeing is coming from a commodity boom. Boom in commodity prices and also trade with China. That has pushed Africa's economic growth to 5.1%, which the World Bank and the IMF are saying. Now, <clears throat> the second pitfall, if you want to help Africa, is to shed political correctness. There are many Americans who do not want to criticize black African leaders for fear that they may be labeled racist. So they shy away from criticisms. But Africans themselves know that we have had catastrophic leadership failure in Africa. Now, since 1960, we have had exactly 227 African heads of state Challenge anybody to name you 20 good leaders, and they won't be able to come up with 20 good leaders out of the 227. Even if they can name you 20, okay? it means that the vast majority of the leadership were utter failures. Africans know this. The slate of the post-colonial leadership has been an assortment of Swiss bank socialists, Jaguar Marxists, Quack revolutionaries, crocodile liberators, and briefcase bandits. <laughs> Africans themselves know this. So no political correctness. Africans simply want you to talk straight to them. Okay. The third pitfall is that for far too long, Western, Westerners and Western leaders and uh, donors have embraced African leaders, the charisma of African leaders, and their rhetoric. As a matter of fact, anybody who comes to Washington, D.C. and professes himself to be 
anti-communist suddenly opens up the floodgates of Western aid. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> these leaders, and I'm sorry to say this, they are crafty. And they have played the West for a sucker. And they have been extracted billions and billions in aid. Remember back in 1998, President Clinton visited Africa and hailed the leaders of Ethiopia, Eritrea, Rwanda, Uganda, Congo, as the new leaders of Africa taking charge of their own backyard. What happened? Barely six months after uh, Clinton returned to the US, Ethiopia and Eritrea were at war. And the rest of the so-called new leaders were at each other's throat in Congo's war. It is not a leadership that is important which will save Africa. Focus on the institutions. Look, Africa had its own market institutions before the colonialists arrived. There were free markets in uh, Africa. Free trade and free enterprise in Africa. That is what needs to be rebuilt in Africa. Not the rhetoric of these leaders. The fourth pitfall that we should recognize is that government is the problem in Africa, not the solution. Africans themselves know what ails them. As a matter of fact, one traditional chief said this. Here in Lesotho, we got two problems. Rats and the government. <laughs> but somehow, Western donors and Western, you know, the IMF and World Bank, they have this abiding faith that they can work with these governments, African governments, form partnerships with them, even bribe them, cajole them, persuade them to reform the abominable systems. As a matter of fact, you know, back in 1981, the World Bank came up with a structural adjustment program. The structural adjustment program was an economic reform program and put up $25 billion to help African countries move away from state-dominated economies to uh, market-based economies. The World Bank tried to persuade 29 African countries. Guess what happened? They took the money and did the Babangida boogie. One step forward, three steps back, a flip and a kick, sidekick to land on the fat Swiss bank account. Much ado about nothing. After one decade, 1981 to 1991, the World Bank found that out of the 29 adjusting countries, only six of them were successful. But even then, those six were the Gambia, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. But then within two years, most, most of those countries are not successfully, they have vanished. So it was a phantom list of success stories. Now, there is something that we need to get straight. The ruling elites are simply not interested in reform, period. Ask them to develop their economies and they'll develop their pocket. Ask them to seek foreign investment, and they will seek a foreign country to invest their loot. Ask them to cut government spending, and they will set up a ministry of less government spending. <laughs> Tell them that good governance is good for the country, and Tanzania set up a ministry of good governance. Ghana was told to, pl uh, to place more reliance on the private sector. And Ghana set up a Ministry of Private Sector Development. Please, don't tell them that free markets will help Africa, because you will see a Ministry of what? <laughs> now, 
there is something else which is, you know, a new threat which has come up, and that is African governments have grown so bloated that they are now suffocating their economies. They all preach free markets. They are all capitalists now. But on the other hand, they're doing everything through their policies to kill the private sector. Take Ghana. Ghana, a country of 25 million, has 97 cabinet and deputy ministers. 97. Kenya has 94. Zimbabwe, 78. The US, with a population of 320 million, has you know, 40 uh, secretaries and assistant secretaries. Now, in Ghana, <clears throat> Uh, let me take Nigeria first. A Nigerian senator has salaries and they claim furniture allowance, travel allowance, entertainment allowance, all those allowances. If you add them, them to, the, uh, to their salaries, they take home a cool $2 million a year. In a country where 60% of the people are poor. Now, in Kenya, the average salary and the uh, allowances a Kenyan MP gets is more than $350,000, which is more than what President Obama is paid. And they get allowances, and you know, you get this. Uh, Kenya, Kenyan MPs say that you know, the roads in Nairobi are so bad that when they travel on the roads to parliament, it shakes their bottom small. <laughs> and so they want rough road allowance. In Ghana, of the 97 ministers and cabinet ministers, each one of them wants to have a government bungalow or a house. And then in addition, he wants an SUV, a saloon car, a driver, a cook, a gardener, a night watchman, a day watchman, and so forth. Now, it got into a point where last week I was in Ghana, and I held a press conference hammered the government about the size of this bloated bureaucracy. That was on November 7th. And on November 8th, the state-owned newspaper called The Daily Graphic put me on their front page. And here it is. It says, reduce government, the size of government. In other words, it's a small victory. But like I said, Africans want straight talk. And this straight talk is beginning to penetrate even in my own country. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, that was so nuanced, it was hard to find a takeaway. But <laughs> But I'm going to go with the two problems, rats and government, OK? <laughs> Our next panelist is Ed Knoll. He's the chair of the Department of Economics at Westmont College. His most recent publications include Reckoning with Markets, More Re Moral Reflection in Economics, and Human Flourishing, the Moral and Economic Case for Economic Growth. His scholarship on the just wage in scholastic and Reformation economic thought, economic institutions in first century Roman Palestine, and Adam Smith's economics has been published in the Journal of, Eco Journal of the History of Economic Thought, Faith in Economics, History of Political Economy, and the Journal of Markets and Morality. Dr. Knoll serves on the editorial board of Faith in Economics, the journal sponsored by the Association of Christian Economists. His current research focuses on the evolution of Christian conceptions of usury, the just price, and legitimate economic gain for a book series entitled Reclaiming the, intellectual, the Christian Intellectual Tradition. Uh, next spring, Dr. Knoll will be a visiting faculty scholar at Duke University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Knoll. Well, I want to thank Anita Folsom and the Free Market Forum for this opportunity to address the subject of capitalism and Christian ethics. 
We've witnessed over the past quarter century the collapse of centrally planned economies in Eastern Europe, the implosion of the Soviet Union, and the adoption of market reforms in China, India, and elsewhere. These events, along with the, great, the glo recent global financial crisis, have spurred theological reflection on capitalism. While some Christian scholars celebrate its moral underpinnings, many others doubt they exist or debate their validity. And of course, uh, modern capitalism has been the subject of scorn by those who are not theologians. Here we have uh, represented capitalism's alleged perverse effects on civil society. In this uh, political sciences work, consumed how markets corrupt children, infantilize adults, and swallow citizens whole. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Going much further, we have um, caricatures of capitalism as depicted in this representation of the anticipated outcome of a wider free trade zone in the Americas. And candidly, I could spend my whole time commenting on this um, a particular caricature, globalization, uber alles, globalization above everything. Um, I'm, I'll resist the temptation to comment on my home state of Texas, where I live now in California, or even Canada here. But um, more seriously, though, there have been criticisms of capitalism uh, leveled that suggest it's an impersonal economic system that overlooks the needs of the poor. So the Christian philosopher Kent Van Til declares, the poor don't have the ability to pay the price asked by the market. Hence, the market doesn't respond to their needs, but only satisfies the wants of those with sufficient income. What are we to make of this particular critique and other related challenges? We want to treat them fairly, without caricature. How is capitalism evaluated in light of Christian ethics? I'll offer this morning a qualified, positive evaluation of capitalism on the basis of Christian values. In 20 minutes, I'll limit my evaluation mainly to those features of the ongoing debate related to capitalism and poverty, the subject of this panel. I'll draw on Holy Scripture and the tradition of Christian teaching on economic matters from my sources. Please note that for time's sake, I won't provide all of the specific references and instead encourage you to find them in my paper on the Hillsdale website. Written in the ancient Mediterranean world, the Bible clearly predates capitalism and offers no blueprint for any particular economic system. Yet the principles God directs ancient Israel to organize their economic activity around in the Pentateuch, wisdom and prophetic literature, reflect uniquely godly values for economic institutions. In the New Testament, we find Jesus expanding on these values, even as market-related institutions slowly begin to be manifested in first century Palestine. By the time that the earliest form of capitalism arrives in Europe, in the 14th and 15th centuries with the commercial revolution, double entry bookkeeping, uh, bills of exchange, uh, commercial capitalism, there's a burgeoning uh, body of Christian moral reflection on the marketplace going on. Later with the industrial revolution, industrial capitalism, Protestant theologians, popes through encyclicals and orthodox scholars have continued to search for the appropriate moral language to evaluate the dynamics of capitalism. Modern capitalism is certainly no less deserving of scrutiny by Christians. And I attempt to contribute to that dialogue here with certain significant caveats in place, which I'll name, again, I find capitalism largely compatible with Christian ethics. Capitalism understood first off now as relying upon the institutions of private property rights, open competitive market exchanges, grounded in voluntary transactions, occupational freedom, and the rule of law to oversee these institutions. These institutions matter since they're the rules of the game that structure economic incentives. When the rules of the game change, the economic incentives change accordingly. And that, of course, can give rise to different forms of modern capitalism. State capitalism, as Fernando de Soto reminds us uh, on the rise in many parts of the world where their security of property rights is absent and where poor entrepreneurs don't have collateral to enable them to obtain credit. There, they can't rely upon the rule of law to enforce contracts as they move into the extra legal sector and product innovations key to driving economic growth under capitalism language. A language. A mixed capitalism where um, government intervenes in the form of tariffs, licenses, or subsidies. Again, the rules of the game are different there, and we want to keep in mind the differences between free market capitalism and other forms. Now let's move to Christian economic ethics 
and we, I suggest they begin with God's creative activity. Genesis 1 through 2 describes God's creative activity in fashioning the earth and its bounty of life. In declaring it six times in Genesis 1 that the creation is good, God affirms the value of the material world. He is the ultimate owner. Moreover, we have a task as creatures made in God's image to combine the resources given to us to create value. This is often identified as the creation mandate to rule and subdue the earth that God owns. That is, we follow God in his initiative and creativity to make the earth productive as God's stewards. The first stewardship task of keeping the garden reflects a vision of delight and flourishing and producing value that by all evidence is God's design and creation. Even after the fall into sin, Genesis 4 provides examples of creative innovation with the fashioning of tools, building of cities, and expression of music and the arts. In some, Genesis offers a vision of creating value added that's associated with human flourishing. It makes the positive Judeo-Christian perspective on wealth creation essentially unique among all other world religions. So what are the implications of this creation mandate for Christian economic ethics? I'll name a few here. First, the scriptures affirm the validity of private property rights for both tangible and intangible property. This human connection to property, as both Michael Novak and Robert Sirico point out, is not merely about control over physical things. Rather, it's tied up with a person's capacity to apply his intellect, to matter and ideas, to look ahead, to plan and steward the use of that possession, human ingenuity. The commandment against theft in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the statements forbidding the movement of a neighbor's boundary marker indicate the significance of private property rights. It's evident that property rights are transferable in the biblical world. This is suggested by directions in the book of Leviticus to sellers and buyers to pay fair prices. There's also archeological evidence of sellers' price lists in the ancient Near East. We've heard from Dave Rose about market transactions grounded in voluntary exchange, creating a positive sum game. Interestingly, in the um, book of Proverbs for the wisdom literature, um, there's an affirmation of the honor associated with legitimate profits, where ill-gotten gains are said to be of no value. Deceptive gain brings death. Honorable gain brings life. Secondly, a crucial form in which the responsible steward acts is in the pursuit of entrepreneurial initiatives to create value in the face of limited knowledge. Such initiatives require a large measure of economic freedom. Entrepreneurial initiatives, of course, are a key element in the dynamic nature of capitalism. Human plans to initiate ways to create wealth inherently face uncertainty. God alone is omniscient. Prospective demand and cost conditions are unknown. The wise steward counts the cost, as Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 14. This inherently involves a subjective forecast of economic conditions drawn up under the constraint of creaturely limitations. Hayek and Bob Mises are right to emphasize that any entrepreneur must make a calculation of cost that is prospective anticipating costs associated with decisions, and not merely account for costs associated with events, as Alfred Marshall posits. Frank Knight highlights the distinction nature of risk when decisions are made with known probabilities. Risk is inherently part of the entrepreneurial process. In the Matthean parable of the talents, Matthew 25, Jesus portrays the master as commending the risk takers among his servants and condemning those who bury their talents in the ground. Now, it's granted uh, that in context, this is a parable told to affirm the responsible use of spiritual gifts, but I think it's significant that Jesus draws on everyday first century Palestinian life to make his point and doesn't condemn risk taking. Thirdly, scripture places a key emphasis on one's obligation as a private property owner. Each Israelite is expected to practice reciprocity in aiding another. When one suffers economically due to a drought or a flood, Interest-free loans are offered. Loans are to be repaid in agricultural produce out of the subsequent harvest. There is the provision of gleanings for the able-bodied poor in the harvest of one's field by the propertyless, that is, the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner. It's worthy of note here that the poor also take some measure of responsibility by being engaged in addressing their poverty problem, as gleaning in the difficult-to-harvest portion of the fields involved hard work. Think here of the Proverbs 31 woman. She buys a field. She further invests her earnings in planting a vineyard. But what else do we read? She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Fourthly, 
God's gifting of humans is manifested in a dispersal of talent. Differing skills and abilities lead to the need for specialization and trade. Individuals, groups, and nations find their comparative advantage and, of course, their comparative disadvantage as well. The dispersal of nations in Genesis 11 upon the leveling of the Tower of Babel has economic implications as each uh, group finds a different endowment of resources. The church fathers observe the benefits of this dispersal of trade around the ancient Mediterranean world. They see trade ultimately bonding nations together again. And I'll mention modern Christian economists picking up on this theme. I'd recommend Dan Finn's new book on Christian economic ethics that, posts, uh, that demonstrates how global North countries, in fact, benefit the global South countries through trade, higher wages, and so forth. But the dispersal of talents is bound to create income inequalities. Rising gaps in income are interpreted by some Christian critics of capitalism as inherently unacceptable. Jim Wallace puts it bluntly, God hates inequality, referring to income inequality. In truth, the picture is not that simple. It's been pointed out that it's much more accurate to say that God hates injustice and oppression, which both produce and exacerbate inequality as I'll try to show when considering the context of the prophetic challenges laid on ancient Israel. So the scriptures affirm that those with more means are responsible to care for those much less well off, but they don't call for direct efforts to lessen income inequality. Addressing poverty and remedying income inequality are not equivalent tasks. And I'm referring the paper to um, my colleague uh, PJ Hill's um, good friend's uh, paper that's I think marvelous on this score. Fifthly, uh, individuals and families must be enabled with the minimum resources needed to pursue their stewardship task and to flourish. And so just real briefly, this is what the division of the land is all about in Joshua, where each uh, tribe receives a portion of the land, a key resource in an agrarian economy, yet it clearly varies in its arability and fertility of soil. The families are responsible for the use of these resources, this undermines the notion of communal natu national resources as somehow God's will for an economic system, and again implies the need for private property rights. The Jubilee in the end is about an economic dignity being restored to the household, where after 50 years their land comes back to them. We might think of an analogy today in our modern service-based economy of the need for provision of education and the building of human capital uh, for each family as a baseline of provision. The details, of course, of how such mechanisms might be established today are not spelled out in the biblical record, but the essential principle of obligation to the less fortunate remains. Then we, uh, I discuss how an economic system must account for fallen human nature, and there are numerous implications here. First off, stewardship can be twisted into the singular pursuit of wealth accumulation. Biblical warnings regarding the perils of wealth obviously predate capitalism. Jesus warns of the spiritual hazards of possessions, telling his disciples not to build possessions on earth, nor to serve mammon, build treasures on earth. In their exegesis of Jesus' teaching on wealth in the Synoptic Gospels, the Patristics and Scholastics build a theological case against avarice. It's true that we find some degree of hostility towards wealth and commerce in the Patristic era. Several of the church followers followed ancient Mediterranean thinking expressed in the notion that since the sum total of humanity's wealth is a fixed amount, a gain by one person must necessarily come at another's expense. Oftentimes this led to a hostility towards the rich who were seen to gain at the expense of the poor by seizing their land or charging them interest on a loan. Secondly, sin can corrupt economic transactions. I've touched on the argument that human creativity and free markets tend to flourish in tandem. Entrepreneurial activity allows others to share in that creativity. The responsible entrepreneur must carefully regard the needs of others in creating value. Their self-interest is checked by both competition and conscience. Conscience can um, constrain competitors, for even though we're fallen uh, creatures, sin has not erased the image of God in each of us, according to the Apostle James. Nevertheless, economic transactions can involve fraud, deceit, or some element of economic coercion. We observe in the scriptures, reneging on loans is condemned. Just prices in exchange must occur. Workers' wages are not to be arbitrarily withheld. False weights and balances are not to be utilized for transaction. Thinking about the latter, through misleading measures of weight, 
Consumers of food and other necessities might be overcharged, and farmers might be underpaid for their produce by wholesalers. <clears throat> Now, as my fellow panelist Dave Rose has emphasized, opportunism is a kind of implicit cost that can be associated with market behavior. But this most often occurs where there are unclear rules of the game, or where one party is able to take advantage of um, ac um, access to government to move the rules in their favor. So thirdly, economic life in a fallen world can be characterized by economic participants seeking to gain economic power over others in accumulating property or raising their incomes. Often such power only endures through government backing of their efforts, which we speak of as rent-seeking activity. This seems to be recognized by the Old Testament prophets. Consider how the prophet Isaiah rebukes the adding of house to house or field to field, or how the prophet Habakkuk speaks against those who gain unjustly for their house. Biblical scholars suggest that these actions likely refer to gains obtained by the family of the king, along with his political advisors and military leaders who obtained their gains through unjust rulings of kings or earlier pre-monarchy through that of the judges. Similarly, in first century Roman Palestine, we find John the Baptist and Jesus each facing economic power wielded over others by those associated with the Roman Empire. When these parties come to be uh, baptized by John, such as the tax collectors, he tells them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. And he says to the Roman soldiers who want to be baptized, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation in Luke 3. Similarly, Jesus commends Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, for making a fourfold restitution of those whom he's defrauded. The notion of a zero-sum economic world that's sometimes alluded to in the New Testament Gospels reflects a widespread perception that the wealthy accrued land through favors offered by Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee or, or through collecting taxes in a capricious manner from peasant farmers. Fourthly, the problem of limited knowledge is exacerbated by the fall. We know that each person has specific knowledge regarding their own skills, resources, and opportunity costs, knowledge not obtainable by government planners, so they shouldn't be enabled with this power. They may have good intentions. These lead to harmful consequences. So the public choice literature tells us. And the market-based alternative is to have economic decisions made across the entire economic system by countless agents who have specialized particular knowledge relative to their own preferences and their technology they have. The prices and resources that flow from such decisions face open market competition in a capitalist system. This also acts to disperse power. Nash observes one of the more effective ways of mitigating the effects of human sin in society is dispersing and decentralizing power through free market social arrangements. And then the treatment of the marginalized, a critical consideration in um, Christian economic ethics. Those who are sometimes named as the poor and the needy are spoken of as the widow, orphan, and sojourner. Mosaic laws requiring gleaning for the poor and interest-free uh, loans reflect the concern for those at the margin. It's not merely, though, to provide sustenance. Given the scripture's high view of personal economic agency, the goal is to assist them to begin again to help themselves and so to regain uh, their dignity. Again, this is where the goal of human flourishing matters. Poverty reduction has a greater weight in the scripture because it propels people forward on their stewardship journey of wealth creation. By the way, I'm not offering here a version of the health and wealth gospel. Scripture clearly recognizes that a follower of God may struggle with poverty. They are not poor because they lack faith, and the faithful do not always become wealthy. <clears throat> In the few instances where government action is connected to the poor, it involves addressing economic injustice. So in Psalm 72, the king is said to be responsible to do justice for the poor. This is not specifically a duty to feed and clothe all the poor, but rather to deliver them from economic impression. Israel's rulers were to ensure that the poor were rightly treated. This concern for the poor is reflected in the benefit of capitalism and economic growth. And, and Adam Smith recognizes this uh, when he speaks of how uh, no society can be uh, flourishing in which uh, the majority of its members are poor and miserable. Uh, for many commentators, Smith highlights the moral uh, structure of capitalism. Um, in our book on economic growth that uh, was mentioned with uh, uh, 
myself, Stephen Smith, not Adam Smith, but, uh, and uh, Bruce Webb um, uh, has more data on that, and for time's sake, I'll refer to that for that data. So I just wrap up here by saying um, <clears throat> my qualified um, endorsement of capitalism really is one that says, let's be careful to not adopt capitalism as an ism and come close to deifying it. It has tremendous wealth creating powers. In many ways, it's compatible with Christian values. But we shouldn't uh, attach such significance to capitalism and its wealth creating abilities that it replaces our sense of God's omnipotence. Nor should we endorse any particular economic outcome as righteous that is being beyond question as long as it's the product of free market forces. The institutions of free market capitalism deserve to be lauded only if we reserve the highest praise for our creator, the ultimate eternal source of all good things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Knoll. For far too, far too many religious leaders seem to suggest that capitalism is somehow fundamentally immoral. And what I appreciate about your presentation is that it reminds us that the Jewish and Christian scriptures, while not advocating a particular economic system, do clearly embrace free market fundamentals, such as the legitimacy of uh, private property and profit. So thank you for reminding us of those points. We do have about 20 minutes left for questions and answers. And uh, I do ask you to raise your hand, and a microphone will come to you. And if you would please limit your preambles, uh, we'll get more questions in. Thank you. First one here. My name is uh, Kwa. I'm from uh, Sterling College, Kansas. And uh, my area, my field of study is in uh, urban planning and uh, real estate development and economics. Um, I ask my student every time in a class, anywhere, always to ask questions. So I'm glad to set an example here. I got a question I want to pose to you all. A lot of times when we talk about uh, economic development, and we say that uh, property rights is one of the major things, and I agree with that. But a lot of us don't talk about property rights in this sense. Property rights involve uh, fee simple and leasehold. A lot of times when you want, to turn, you want to turn property rights and say that, hey, we'll give you the land, that is very, very, very difficult because of traditions and everything. Now, in Singapore and China, I was born and raised in Singapore, but lived in the States for the last 30 years. In Singapore, for example, you can have property rights, you can have a leasehold. My mother-in-law right now lives in an apartment which is a leasehold for 99 years. She can sell that leasehold. And she says, son, my leasehold is worth more than a quarter million dollar in US, 1,400 square feet of space. I'm saying that even people like Hernandez de Soto, eminent development economists, again, when they talk about property rights, they're always thinking in terms of simple fee. Now we need to talk about leasehold. It makes it easier for people to have that right and develop that with, with that leasehold. And development is something very, very fruitful. You see that a lot in uh, Singapore, especially, and China. All right. And my question is, what do you think about this concept of uh, property rights in terms of leasehold? Okay. So uh, free market economists give short shrift to, to anything outside of absolute ownership. Uh, any responses from our panelists? David? I think that's uh, a great point. And uh, I've been a uh, big fan of Singapore's situation. In fact, I did some papers a, year, uh, a number of years ago on economic development in China. And uh, one of the things that my co-author and I had to face up to was what we called the Lee Kuan Yew problem. And we, we considered it a problem because conventional wisdom at the time was that Democracy was kind of a de facto necessary condition for a thriving capitalist society, and yet Lee Kuan Yew kind of ruined that story. Well, if you think about economic history further back, uh, the rise of free market institutions and capitalism don't occur under democracy. They occur mostly under monarchies in early Europe. 
So what was, what's really, really important is confidence by ordinary people in the rules of the game. Uh, when they have that, that allows competition to run wild, under, under some constraints, of course, but run wild in a positive kind of way. And I think that that's what someone like a Lee Kuan Yew or a, a king in England or whatever can, can bring to the table at some point. And so I, I think that that's, that's a terrific point. I, I agree with you completely. Ed? Well, I, I, I think it's a very interesting point. Um, Lee Kuan Yew, in many ways, was a model for Deng Xiaoping. He, Deng Xiaoping visited uh, Singapore late 1970s and implemented reforms of leasing land back to Chinese farmers. In the early 1980s um, and following, output um, tremendously exploded when uh, Chinese farmers didn't have to produce everything for the state, but co could uh, produce for themselves and sell that as well. In 2007, uh, the Chinese uh, government began to open up property rights and extend their length. They've just recently moved that way as well. It'd be an interesting study. I think there's an important, um, not just correlation, but causation going there, is expanding their rights under leasing to property and expanding output and production. So I think there's some validity there. All right, we have a question in the front here. This is from Mr. Aite. Um, President Bush uh, instituted what I believe called the Millennium Fund, and I was wondering how you would compare that with past development funds and how it is doing presently. Um, they are part of the uh, pitfalls in the attempts to uh, to aid Africa. And uh, remember that you know, before Bush, uh, President Clinton set up AGOA, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. You know, um, saying that well, look, you know if. If African governments reformed their economies and did this and that, you know, the U.S. would throw open the, uh, its market to African goods and so forth. Very, very, very few countries uh, sort of uh, benefited from that. You know, one country was Lesotho, and then there was also another country uh, like Tanzania. And then when Bush came to power, <coughs> he set up the Millennium uh, Development uh, Challenge Account. And that was even more stringent. And there were three criteria. Those African governments that uh, governed justly and also invested in education in their people and also promoted economic freedom will be eligible for grants. And I get this, grants. Grants means that they were not going to be paid back. Now, they... Uh, uh, requirements and benchmarks and conditions were so stringent that no African country sort of uh, qualified. <laughs> so guess what? In 2003, in 2000, and, I'm sorry, in 2006, the Bush administration gave Tanzania $11 million to help it qualify <laughs> for a grant, okay? Now, all right, okay, Tanzania, you know, accepted the money and, you know, implemented reform. And how did Tanzania do? In two, February 2006, Bush went on the trip to Tanzania. And when he got there, he found that the entire cabinet in the uh, government had resigned over a corruption scandal. And then get this. The anti-corruption czar called Edward Husea he himself was implicated in the corruption scandal himself. <laughs> so that was what happened to the Bush, you know, Millennium Develop, uh, sorry, Ch Millennium Challenge account. You know, it didn't succeed. Right here in front. So how does the free world help Africa, How, what should they do? Well, <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> well, 
It's, uh, first of all, like I said, you know, the pitfalls that I, you know, indicated. Number one, you know, avoid hype. You know, number two, um, look, shared political correctness. You know, Africans know exactly what's wrong with their continent, okay? Uh, number three, you know, um, pay more attention to the institutions. Uh, institutions that, critical institutions, such as the media, the judiciary, the electoral commission, and so forth. And forget about government. The government is the problem. And also, the fifth one, which I, should, I, I didn't have time to mention, was that, you know, if you, if you want to help, you know, you have to make it up your mind, whom do you want to help, the government or the people? Now, African economy is divided into three sectors. There's the modern sector, there's the traditional sector, and then stuck in between is the informal sector. The modern sector is the abode of the ruling vampire elites. That's what I call them. And then, you know, the vast majority of the African people, you can find them in the informal and the traditional sectors. If you want to help the poor people of Africa, go into the uh, informal and the uh, traditional sectors. Now, institutions, 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 that's what uh, needs to help Africa. And as a matter of fact, in March of 2009, Barack Obama was in Africa. He came to Ghana, and Ghana was the first you know, country that he visited, and he said something which I've been saying all along, and that was that he says, Africa doesn't need strong leaders. Africa needs strong institutions. Okay. Now, me, to me, the best gift Americans can give to Africa is a free and independent media, so that Africans themselves can speak out and uh, debate, solu <laughs> debate solutions for, for their own problems. Look, they have thrown me in jail in Senegal. Security agents raided my hotel room in uh, Nairobi. Even in Washington, I wasn't safe. My uh, office was firebombed. Okay? Now, uh, in March of, 2000 and, uh, uh, March of 2009, I met uh, Hillary, uh, that's the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Uh, he was to go on a nine nation tour of Africa and he collect, uh, you know, he assembled a, a few African experts to ask them to pick their brains in terms of what she should do. Now, when he got to my turn, I told her that, look, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Remember the former Soviet Union? Now, what led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union? Okay. Now, what led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union was Radio Free Europe. What Africa needs is radio-free Africa. Okay. And you know, she thought about that, and she said, that's a good idea. Never heard much about that. So <laughs> the thing is, you know, the point that I want to emphasize again and again and again is that it is Africans who have to solve their own problems. And they need to have the freedom and the media to discuss their problems and solutions to their to uh, solutions to their problems. Now, reform, which is internally generated, is far more sustainable than reform, which is dictated from the outside. And that is why, you know, I've constantly been preaching African solutions for African problems. It doesn't mean that Americans shouldn't help. Americans can help, but they should help, you know, support the solutions that Africans themselves have created, to crafted to solve their own problems. Good morning, and thank you very much. My name is Don Rochter. I'm president of Public Interest Institute in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. It's a free market, limited government, traditional values think tank. The problem, as I go around in Iowa and talk to average people, is they think that capitalism is immoral. Now, the th hundreds of us in this room have been persuaded otherwise by your eloquent presentations this morning. And maybe even thousands will be persuaded by seeing the reprint from the videotape on the Hillsdale website. But most people get their information from the mass media, which is full of bubbleheads who think uh, that, that, well, they have no knowledge of economics and even less of faith. And so my, ask, my question to you is, how do we overcome that relentless pounding of the crap such as Barbara puts out that was illustrated in Dr. Knowles' slide? 
that we are not on the side of the angels. I'd like, I'd like to take a crack at that, if I might. Um, one of the problems that we have uh, in our society is people uh, who vote often don't know much about anything. <laughs> and they, they particularly don't know much about economics. And that's nothing new in saying that. Many people have said that before. But I think the problem's even deeper than that. I think the way economists teach economics is uh, very counterproductive. Uh, there's an object to our study. It's called the economy. The economy has a history. It's a real thing. If you go back in human history, it's a fairly simple thing. As time goes on, it gets more complex and there's more competitive variants. It only stands to reasons that a young person's ability to understand economics uh, will be greater the further back in history you try to study the economy. Uh, in my view, uh, we should start teaching children at first, second grade about the very, very simple concepts of gains from cooperation like we talked about today. You couldn't get simpler. Gains from exchange, which has a very similar mathematical structure. And then you build up with that, complementing it with actual economic history so that several years down the road, they're starting to talk about things like supply and demand and market pricing and so on and so forth. The way we teach economics now, overwhelmingly, is we love our tools. And as Ronald Coase uh, likes to say, uh, we like our graphs because it gives us something to do. And so we organize our classes around throwing a bunch of tools at people. And it's fun to do and so on and so forth. We don't really think about the fact that there's some kind of an ultimate objective to what we're doing. We're supposed to be learning about the economy. You got to learn about the thing as a whole, and you got to learn about the parts. So we have macro and we have micro, but we've gotten away from that. And I don't know that we were ever there, but certainly since the neoclassical revolution, we've been too far from that. So I think what we need is a revolution at K through 12 education. We need to stop conceding the battle until it's too late. Uh, by the time we get students at 18, 19 years old. Um, they've had uh, social justice theory drummed into their heads continuously for 12 years. So now we're fighting a pill. Those are easy ideas for the brain to understand because they comport with our natural moral sensibilities. So people who are advocates of those positions really have a huge advantage. Uh, they're basically just asking people to indulge their atavisms. Our job is much, much, much harder. The uh, institutions of a large free market society are extremely complex. They're invented and they're abstract. So there's no particular reason for us to find them easy to understand. Yeah, um, let me add to that, and that, and that is uh, coming from Africa where there's so much hostility against capitalism. I'll tell you how I deal with it. You know, uh, number, uh, The first thing is I point out to my students that there are two definitions of capitalism. There is a, a Marxian definition of capitalism. And the, the Marxists define capitalism as a system which is based upon the exploitation of labor. Now, that type of definition has really, really gained currency in the third world and you know, also in the communist world. Okay? Whereas, you know, any economist would tell you that capitalism is simply a system uh, in which you know, in the private individuals solve the economic problems of what to produce for whom and you know, how. Now, <clears throat> the second way by which I deal with it is to, to tell uh, anybody who asks me about capitalism uh, that there are various forms of capitalism. Uh, Japanese capitalism is not the same as American capitalism or British capitalism or French capitalism or whatever. So when he says, that, how come you're preaching capitalism, an immoral you know, sort of ideology, I ask him, which type of capitalism do you mean? And that shuts them up. <laughs> well, my frame of reference is, uh, again, sort of largely the college university setting. Um, and uh, I'm not totally, um, you know, cons I don't totally believe it's uh, a fruitless effort to try to uh, work some uh, convincing of uh, economic principles at that level. Um, I think that uh, there are creative ways to get students to see even if they're not economics majors, uh, how economic principles are valuable. 
interdisciplinary efforts, pointing out in the classics of literature, Victorian novels, other kinds of older uh, works that are classics, uh, the economic principles there, students that come from other disciplines, English literature, um, and the humanities um, appreciate that. I think in the classroom itself, uh, I very much appreciate Coase's uh, critique and uh, really hoping his journal um, that he helped to want to get founded uh, right before he passed away here not that long ago, gets going, a non-mathematical sort of journal um, in economics. But games in the classroom, hands-on efforts uh, are important. I can't really think what also matters is uh, for many, for, well, for some folks anyway, what's said in the pulpit? You know, what's happening in the pulpit? What's the perspective of, uh, of, of capitalism there? The efforts to increase the dialogue between theologians and economists, of uh, bringing the seminarians that are trained and understanding economic principles could be another venue as well. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, no, you've, you've had one, so let's see if we can have one more that hasn't had a chance. Uh, way in the back. Hi there. Um, I have a question. Uh, how much damage do you think uh, the work of Paulo Freire, uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed, has done, uh, which was, I'm, I'm from Ireland, and I was uh, trained as a teacher in Ireland, and uh, in a college that was, was training people to be religion teachers, and it was required reading, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is very powerful uh, for people of good faith and, uh, you know, pe nice people, which is a Marxist analysis of capitalism, um, and I believe is, is, is used in, in teacher training colleges all over the world. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, and I wonder how, how prolific it still is. Thank you. Ed, we're going to let you have the last word in terms of answering that. Sure. Well, I, I am um, uh, familiar with that line of thinking and that work. Um, I think as well of, um, in a Latin American context, of course, coming out of the 70s and 80s, liberation theology as well. Um, and... Um, the, uh, I think the influence of Marx himself sort of wax and wanes in uh, seminaries. Um, I think postmodern thinking uh, regarding um, a kind of relativism about um, uh, values um, is making inroads there. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it, it uh, certainly is a, um, a metaphor that's um, unfortunately tapped into many times by theologians. But again, um, the hope is that as people unpack uh, scriptures and the tradition of church teaching about what it really means to be oppressed and, um, and, and not just sort of take to, for granted that oppression inherently comes from capitalism and hopefully efforts like this and others uh, to counter that will be helpful. So, Thank you. While Anita makes her way to the podium for announcements, please thank our panel.